Right here, we're going to be beginning this week, officially starting our Bible study, going through the book of Matthew. So this is going to be Matthew chapter number one, week number one. There's going to be 28 weeks where we're going through uh, each of the individual chapters of the book of Matthew. So this will be the first week. Last week, we had the introduction. And one of the things I want to remind you of, and this is going to be extremely important, is the theme of the book of Matthew. And we're going to see it here in the beginning of the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter number one. We're going to see it all the way through every single chapter, strongly. You know, this theme is not just something light. It's, it's, it's very obvious. It's very deep. It's deeply embedded. All of the themes of the Gospels. Now, there are four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What the Gospels are generally or roughly, they are, they are basically or essentially the record of the eyewitnesses of the life, the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is virtually what the Gospels record. Uh, and they are, of course, written by you know, those that were eyewitnesses. You can verify that just through you know, uh, uh, the basic face value reading. Now, each of these Gospels have different themes. Because people ask, why are there four Gospels? Because there's a lot of stories that are repeated. There's a lot of unique stories. And none of them are exactly alike. You know, many people try to point to contradictions within the Gospels, which there are no contradictions. You know, they don't contradict, they complement. You learn by comparing them to one another. And, you know, uh, uh, the book of Matthew will have a certain focus, while the book of Mark will have a certain focus, the book of Luke and the book of John likewise. Now, the book of Matthew, the theme is the king of the Jews. This is a very strong theme. We're going to see it strongly here in Matthew chapter number 1. And I'll just want to real quickly, briefly go through the other themes of the other Gospels. The book of Mark, the theme is Jesus as a servant. It is Jesus being of no reputation. Um, so the book of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And that specific genealogy highlights him being a Jew, him being the king of the Jews. Well, the book of Mark has no genealogy. It has no pedigree at all. The book of Luke has a genealogy. The, look, the book of J uh, uh, John, excuse me, has a genealogy of sorts. And I'll get to that in just a second. But the book of Mark has no genealogy. There's not very much speaking coming from Jesus. Um, it's a lot of like kind of over his shoulder kind of watching him. And uh, it's, it's geared toward Jesus being a worker, being a servant, coming and, and, and being his humility. And uh, it's just, it's not as much preaching, like I said, it's a lot of him just working. It's him being of no reputation. That's why it has no genealogy. He just kind of came from nowhere. He's a nothing, basically, is kind of what it's, you know, in that sense, of course, is what it's uh, putting forth. Is that he, he, had put, he made himself nothing. He made himself a man of, of humility, right? The book of Luke, the theme is the Son of Man. So that phrase is found in all the Gospels, but it's found many more times, an excess more of more times in the book of Luke. Many more times it's found in the book of Luke as opposed to the book of Matthew, Mark, and John. The Son of Man. It focuses on his humility. There's a genealogy right here in Matthew. There's also a genealogy in Luke. And they're not identical. The one in Luke follows all the way back to Adam. So it goes, the genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Well, this genealogy, as we're going to see here in a minute, goes back to Abraham. Why? Because it wants to highlight that he's a Jew. Who was the father of the Jews? The Jews, when they speak of their father, who are they always talking about? Abraham, right? When you look at the genealogy in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, it, does, it goes further than Abraham. It goes all the way back to Adam. Why? Because it wants to depict him and, 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 and present Jesus in the light of his humanity. It focuses on him being a man, more so in the book of Luke. The famous story that you hear like in uh, 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 Charlie Brown's Christmas, this, the famous story that is read from the Bible of Jesus' birth, that is found in the book of Luke. You find more of a focus and, and much more details of when Jesus is born in the book of Luke. Why? Because it's focusing on his humanity, the fleshly aspect of Jesus. The book of John doesn't have a physical genealogy, but it speaks of Jesus being God. And it starts off and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The book of John heavily focuses on Jesus being God. If you want to try to find one book to try to prove that Jesus is God, 
I mean, you just, it is just a buffet if you want to turn to the book of John. Like, all of the most famous verses come from the book of John, where he's, you know, he's telling Philip, you know, he says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And he tells him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? He says, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. You know, he tells him, he says, in uh, uh, John chapter number 8, you know, uh, uh, that's where the, the Jews are accusing him of being a devil. And he's, he speaks of how, you know, uh, um, oh, I can't even remember how it's quoted. What is the verse in John 8, 24? Um, they, understood not. they understood not well prior to that. Goodness, it just totally, I quote it all the time and I totally lost it. But there's numerous, numerous verses, you know, throughout the book of John where he even says, before Abraham was, I am. So just over and over and over again in the book of John, he's just over and over again, he's focusing on himself being God. That, that is the theme of the book of John. It is that, the, that Jesus Christ was God himself in the flesh. Like I said, it doesn't start out with a genealogy. It starts out with that he was here in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it tells us, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So, Matthew, it has a genealogy. And right here in Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 1... It highlights two people within that genealogy to tell you the whole theme of the book of Matthew, which is the king of the Jews. Look at Matthew chapter number 1. Look at verse number 1. It says this, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So notice that it says, the book of the generation. Now that refers to the life, but it's also a word that's referring to his genealogy. It says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, and it tells you two specific people that he descends from. The son of David and the son of Abraham. I want you to look down at verse number 6. It says this, And Jesse begat David the king. So who is it identifying David as? It identifies David as who? The king. Now, from David on, every one of these guys is a king. But David is known as the king of Israel. He was the greatest king that they had. He's looked to you know, more so than any of the other kings. Now Solomon, of course, had riches and things along those lines. But David was really the first king. David uh, of Judah, that is, of the line of Judah. He replaced Saul. David was a great man. He was a man after God's own heart. He's, in that sense, he is far above all the others. And he's highlighted here, while no one else is, as David the king. Well, who else does it say? It says the son of David, who is the king, and then it says the son of Abraham, is who is who? He's the father of the Jews. There is your theme of the book of Matthew, and we're going to see this continue on strongly throughout uh, the entire book. Look at verse number 2. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Now, right there, you're already right off the bat going to notice that some of these names are a little bit different, right? Judas there is Judah of the Old Testament. And here in just a minute, I'm going to kind of go over just real quickly. And uh, you can, of course, go back and listen to the audio or listen to this video if you'd like uh, um, and, and uh, compare this and get and take notes of what I'm going to go over. But I'm going to show you some of the differences between uh, the names of the Old Testament and the New Testament and how to be able to kind of tell who you're speaking about. And I'll show you why that matters and why it's interesting here in just a minute. But Judas there, that is the Old Testament name Judah, right? Well, so we'll see that S there is kind of, uh, has is replaced the H. So it says Judas, or Judah as we know him, and his brethren. That's the twelve tribes of Israel, who is Jacob. Verse 3, And Judas begat Perez and Zara of Thamar. And Perez begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram. And Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasin. And Naasin begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Booz of Rechab. And Booz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse, and then verse 6, and Jesse begat David the king. Now that's our first uh, delineation because these are broken down into 14 generations. And I want to highlight something that we're going to come back to later. There in verse number 3 it tells us this. It says, and Judas begat Perez of Zara, and Zara, I'm sorry, of Thamar. Now, Perez and Zara were twins. We were told about this in the book of Genesis. It's Genesis chapter number 38 is where this takes place. I want you to go ahead and turn back to there. So use your bulletin as I suggest all the time. Go back to with me to Genesis chapter number 38 and I want to read about this. Now one thing that's interesting about this genealogy to begin with is we don't always see this but we see a few women that are mentioned in the genealogy here. In verse number 3 it says again, And Judas begat Perez and Zara, and then it says, Of 
Thamar. Now that's Tamar of the Old Testament. Thamar, it says there. That is a woman of the Old Testament. Now you may or may not be familiar with that. That's why I want to go over it real quick and we'll get an idea of what took place here. And I want to reference something here in just a minute. Look at Genesis chapter 38, verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her and she conceived and bare a son. And he called his name Ur. So this is the first son of Judah. It says Ur was his name. And she conceived again and bare a son and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was, and he was at Chezeb when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. So there we see Tamar being mentioned. Um, but I want, I want to point out to you, you may or may not have noticed this if you're not familiar with it. You, and uh, we're going to read the entirety of the story, but this may puzzle you right now. But notice it said, And Judas begat Perez and Zara, it says, of Thamar. So I want you to notice that in the genealogy, in Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 3, it's telling you that Judas, Judas begat Perez, right, of who? Of Thamar. Well, here when we read so far, it tells us that, that Tamar was the wife of Ur who was the, the son of Judah. Okay, well look at verse 7. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. It says, and the Lord slew him. So obviously he's a very, a very evil, wicked man to where God intervenes. And of course he's dealing very closely with the nation of Israel, with Judah, knowing that of this line is going to come the Christ one day. He takes this very seriously and... Of course, he must have been a very evil man, er, to, to the point where God just wouldn't put up with it anymore. It says, and he slew him. And God does this very, very often uh, throughout the Bible, especially when he's dealing with the, the nation of Israel and you know, his people. He will punish those that he loves and those that are his children. Look at what it says in verse 8. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up seed to Thy brother. So now Judah goes to the second born, and, he, and, and that's Onan. And he's saying, hey, I want you to go in unto your brother's wife. Because this was, of course, you know, this ended up being the law later. This was right to do because she's a widow now. And he's of age. So he says, hey, Onan, I want you to go in unto your brother's wife and marry her. And then it says, and raise up seed to thy brother. So it would, it would be in his brother's name. The, the, the child would live on after Ur's name. Uh, basically, that it was Ur's uh, uh, son. That's how that they would treat this situation. Look at verse 9. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, saying whatever child is born, he knew that this, this child was not going to be named after himself. It was not going to be carrying on his lineage, if you will. So, and Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife, it says that he spilled it on the ground. Now, of course, that's referring to the relationship between husband and wife and, of course, you know, married couples right now and those that are older are going to understand what it's talking about. So he spilled the seed specifically. It says that he knows that the seed was not going to be his, so it says that he spilled the seed on the ground because the child was not going to be named after him. It was not going to be carrying on his lineage. And it says, less, like unless, that he should give seed to his brother. So he wanted this child to be, you know, to carry on his name, but he's, he's obviously upset that, you know, it would be, you know, carrying on his brother's name, so he just doesn't even, you know, give seed to his now wife, Tamar. And look at verse 10. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Now, this kind of stuff doesn't happen where he's intervening with individual people very often in the Bible. But you can see that God is very serious about this. Now, number one, I believe that it's a commandment to be fruitful and multiply. You know, we're told to bring forth abundantly. You know, uh, this commandment is given multiple times in the Bible. You know, uh, in the, the book of Psalms, it speaks about the man that has many children. It talks about as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And he says, happy is the man that hath his quick full of them, saying it's full of them. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 next, the ne very next chapter, I believe it's like Psalm uh, 129, I believe is what it is. 
It speaks of how, you know, how the blessed family is going to have children just round about her, the, the table. You know, that is a blessing for, you know, children of God and for Christians to have many children. We're, we're commanded, be fruitful and multiply. So, of course, that is one sin that was being committed here. That's, that is a, a sin that was being committed, but I believe it goes further than that. I believe that it is also because this is the line that the Christ is going to be coming from. When you read throughout the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament is just pointing towards the coming of the Christ. That's what the whole Old Testament is about. We get to the first book of the, the New Testament, and it's not a coincidence. Hey, here's the genealogy of the Christ that you've been reading about all throughout the Old Testament. He's come. Here is the Messiah. So that's why I believe that this is so serious, and he slew both of them. Look at verse number 11 now. Let's continue. It says, Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. <coughs> Verse 13, And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her, and covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. So now, so she sees and she understands, hey, you know, Shayla is of age. This is Judah's third born son, right? Shayla is of age and, and Judah had promised that he would give Shayla as soon as he was of age to Tamar to marry, right? And then uh, what has taken place here, his wife had died. You know, he's, he, he, once he was comforted, it says he's, he's, he's traveling, right? He's going to, you know, to shear his sheep, he's traveling. And Tamar had heard that he's going to travel, and I want you to notice what it says. Look at verse number 15. It says, When Judah saw her, I'm sorry, verse 14. And she put her widow, widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, for she, saw, for she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. So it says that she put her widow's garments off, right? And it says she covered herself in a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot. And that's what exactly what she was going for. It says, because she had covered her face. So that's a sign of a, of a woman that is a harlot, is what it's telling you there. It's because it's a shame. It's a shameful thing to be a prostitute. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because women nowadays dress worse than harlots did then. Women were so ashamed, it's telling you, when they were a prostitute, like an actual literal prostitute, that they would make sure they covered their face so that no one knew what they were doing, that they were actually getting paid for relations. So they covered their face so nobody would know who they are. Now, and, and, and you look around at women today, and a lot of the women that you maybe would, would refer to as, as being scantily clad, or people would even refer to them as, as being whorish or dressing like a whore, those women are, would, the women of the past who were actual literal whores and harlots were more modest than women who aren't even whores today. Who just, we would say, hey, she's dressed like a whore, which is a complete and absolute shame. Women had more decency then in the way that they dressed than they do today. Even harlots did than how just a regular casual woman dresses today. Look at what it says next. Verse 16, And he turned unto her by the way, and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law, and she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? Now when she's saying, Come in unto me, this is you know, obviously referring to the relations again, that a husband and wife are supposed to have. Now does this sound like this is a very godly or righteous situation that's going on right now? It's a very wicked thing that is happening, right? Uh, let me ask you this question. So this obviously looks very sinful. Does, is what Tamar is doing, does that sound good? Does it sound wicked as well? It's evil. What is Judah doing? Is that good? It's wicked as well. What happened to the first two children of Judah? Were they, did they seem like they were a righteous seed? Like he was raising up a righteous you know, a, a remnant that was going to be you know, going forth and, and conquering great things for God in the spiritual world? Not at all. They were both wicked and got to the point where God slew them. 
So you can see right now that, that this particular line or genealogy right now, how does it look? I mean, how does it look? What would you say? Very evil and wicked, doesn't it? Well, keep reading. Look at what it says. He says, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? Verse 17. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? So he's saying, What are you going to pay me? And he's saying, I'll send you a kid from the flock. He's saying, I don't have it now, but I'll send it to you later. She said, Will you give me a pledge? Right? You know, a, a pledge, obviously, it's just like something like a surety. It's something that you're like promising, right? That I will give it to you later. You know, uh, till thou send it. And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, thy signet and thy bracelet. So this is something that can specifically identify who he is as a person. And thy staff that is in thy hand. And he gave it to her and came in unto her. And she conceived by him. So I want you to notice that now, Tamar is with child by who? Judah. By Judah. By her father-in-law, her previous father-in-law. Verse 19, And she arose up and went away and, lay, and laid by her veil from her, and laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his, his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the way? Uh, the wayside. And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah, Judah, and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. He said, I tried to pay her, but she's not there. Let her just take it to her. And it came to pass about three months after that, that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying... By the man who these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet the, and bracelets and staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah my son. And he knew her to, again no more. And it, it says, And it came to pass in the time of her travail, it says, Watch this, Behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed, that's labor, that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold his brother came out and she said how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. It says therefore his name was called Perez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was called Zara. So there you have Perez and Zara being recorded. Go back with me to Matthew chapter number 1 and look back again at verse number 3. It told us in Judas. Remember that's Judah now of the Old Testament. And Judas begat Perez and Zara. Those were the twins that we just saw being born of Tamar. And that's Tamar of the Old Testament. So does it look like already, like this seemed like this is a, a very godly couple? Or, or is, does this kind of seem like it's not somebody that you would expect to find in the line or the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? I think that's what most people would say. It goes on, it says, And Pharez begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasin, and Naasin begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Booz of Rechab. Now that's Boaz of the Old Testament. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Now, like I said, oftentimes women are not mentioned in genealogies. But it's interesting because we find a few different women mentioned in this. Number one, we saw Tamar in verse number three. Look with me at verse number 5. It tells you and says, Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. That is also, that's another woman. Ruth of the Old Testament, the book of Ruth. That's who that's speaking to. That genealogy is given us, just like it's pinned down right there, at the end of the book of Ruth, the very last chapter. Then it goes on in verse number 6 and says, And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat, watch this, Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Now that's Uriah. Right? That's Uriah right there. So that is what we see so far is Tamar, Ruth, and uh, also there was another woman, I'm sorry, Rahab. Verse 5, I totally missed that. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab. Now that is Rahab of the Old Testament. So we actually have four women so far that have been mentioned here. Tamar, uh, Rahab, Ruth, 
And then at the end of verse number 6, what woman is it speaking of? I want you to notice how it's worded too. It says that David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. That's referring to Uriah of the Old Testament. Uriah. Now, does anyone remember who was formerly the wife of Uriah? Do you remember what her name was? That was Bathsheba. That's who that's referring to, right? Bathsheba. Now, her name is not pinned down, but I think that it's very important, you know, that we notate that her name is not put down. It's mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. Obviously, the Holy Spirit could have recorded that, but it chose to, to highlight or to draw attention to the grievous sin that was committed. Do you remember exactly what took place with Bathsheba? Of course, David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he killed, he had Uriah murdered. And, and the, the, the uh, child that was born uh, from that uh, particular situation, God struck and God killed as a punishment to David, right? So notice that it, it brings attention to the fact that this woman was the woman of who? Uriah. So what automatically are you going to think of what David did to Uriah? Saying that, hey, he was rightfully, or she was rightfully Uriah's wife. You know, and it, 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 all throughout the Bible, we see God just, one of the sins that God condemns more than almost any other sin in the entire Bible is the, is the sin of adultery. And the reason why is because it's so destructive. You know, when one man goes in into another woman when he's married, or vice versa, you know, a woman goes and lies down with another man when she is married, right? You know, the Bible condemns this repeatedly. The Bible puts the death penalty, it sub subscribes the death penalty for, prescribes the death penalty for this because it is such a grievous, wicked, wicked sin. It's so hurtful to everyone that's around you. It's the most destructive sin that anyone could possibly commit. You look at what it's done to people when, you know, someone has committed adultery. It just destroys everyone's life around them. And it's something that you don't just move past. You know, maybe somebody can steal something. They commit a sin and they steal something. Maybe even, you know, commit a, a really bad sin of just multitude of things. Stealing something, robbing, you know, someone, drunk driving, things like that. You know, adultery is one of those things that you just can't move past. You can move past almost every other sin. But when somebody commits adultery on you, and you know, hey, you're supposed to forgive. You're supposed to, you know, uh, uh, you're, you know obviously, and we're going to get into this tonight. Divorce is not an option according to the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. But you know what? That wound is always going to be there. Now, according to God's law in the Old Testament, if someone committed adultery on you, it would be the death penalty upon their head, and then, of course, you would be free to marry whom you will. So it makes perfect sense, and it looses that person from that, and they're able to get you know, true resolution and then move on. Um, but notice it brings attention to that. And notice that's another woman that was married. Now, I'm sorry, that was uh, in the genealogy. So we have four women that have been mentioned in the genealogy. Number one was Tamar. Now, is Tamar depicted in a good light in the Bible? What we know about her? Of course not, right? She, she's in this genealogy only because for the simple act, or the simple fact of her committing the act of uh, fornication with her father-in-law and deceiving him into doing so by pretending to be a harlot. I mean, that's pretty wicked. That's pretty evil and sinful, right? The next woman that we have that's mentioned in verse number 5 is Rahab. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but where it says Rahab, the R-A-C-H-A-B, that is actually Rahab. And I'm going to show you how to understand these names and how to figure out the Old Testament name with the New Testament name, right? So you can identify who it is. But that's Rahab. Does anybody remember Rahab from the Old Testament? What was Rahab? Rahab the harlot. Exactly the same as Tamar. Isn't that interesting, right? So Rahab is actually in the genealogy and in the line of the birth of Christ. A lot of people don't know that. And, uh, you know, Rahab was, uh, was she who led the messengers in and hid the messengers. And, uh, you know, uh, she hid them and, and harbored them and, 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 you know, allowed them to be refugees in her home. And, and, of course, she sent away the men that came to try to look for them. And Joshua salvaged her life saved her life and her whole family's life. And then it tells you in the book of Joshua that they dwelled in Israel until that day. So she came and just assimilated uh, into uh, the land of Israel and with the people of Israel. And she actually ended up, you know, uh, uh, marrying, it tells us there, Boaz. It says, and Solomon begat Boaz. It says, oh, I'm sorry, Solomon, I'm sorry. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rechab. So Solomon there married 
uh, Rahab in the early years of Israel. And there was a child that was brought forth. And it says that uh, that child was Boaz. And then, of course, we know that Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Boaz was he who, you know, took Ruth in. Now, who was Ruth? It's very important. I want to highlight these people real quickly. These are women that are mentioned, and they're all very particular women that are in the line of Jesus Christ. Who was Ruth? Ruth was also a foreigner. Now, Rahab, I want you to think about that. Rahab was of the Canaanites. The Canaanites were wicked. They were extremely evil. God waited. You know, he told Abraham, like, hey, I'm not going to give you the land yet because, you know, I'm waiting for the, the sins of the, the, the transgressions of the Canaanites to be full. When, they, when it would be justifiably, you know, uh, it would be justified for me to send people in here to wipe them out because of all of the violence and the wickedness that they perform. So he waited for them to get to a certain point. And I mean, it records some of the horrible, wicked things that they did in practice. They were heathen. They were pagan. They were just horribly, just exceedingly sinful group of people. And Rahab was of them. And she was a harlot. She obviously wasn't a very good person, right? And Ruth was also a foreigner. Ruth was a Moabitess. In the book of Ruth, Ruth was one that married into an Israelite when they moved away. So, of course, uh, uh, you know, you have, uh, 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 you know, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law that moved away and, uh, you know, her husband. And um, I'm, for whatever reason, my mind is just, I can't think of it right now. But Ruth ends up coming back with her mother-in-law and she m ends up marrying Boaz. She ends up marrying Boaz, has a child, and the child that they have is Jesse, or I'm sorry, Obed, uh, uh, and then Obed begat Jesse, and then Jesse begat David the king. So we can see that they're also in the line of Christ. And then, I want, and then also the other woman that's mentioned, the other woman is Bathsheba, again, was Bathsheba a godly woman? Not even close. They all, obviously, we know that you know, David coerced her into it, but she, of course, submitted to it. So what she had done and the context in which she is highlighted is very sinful and wicked, of course, as well. So notice the, the women that are mentioned, they have a rocky history. They have a rocky past, for sure. And they're not just... Uh, they, don't, they, they don't just have you know, just this, this clean, pure background... Uh, before converting and to, you know, to Christianity, if you will. Look there at verse number 7. Yeah, so we'll keep reading here and finishing these genealogies. I want to highlight a couple of things again here in these last few verses of the genealogies. It tells us, And Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat jo Jeotham, and Jeotham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manasseh, and Manasseh begat Amon. And Amon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren. And then it says, about the time that they were carried away to Babylon. That's the other 14 generations. The first 14 was from Abraham to David. The next 14 was from David to Salathiel and, that's, and his brethren when they were carried away into Babylon. When Nebuchadnezzar came in and besieged the city, destroyed the city, and then ended up carrying them away into captivity, took them into captivity at that time. That was with Salathiel. Now, so that was the, the, the second 14 generations that passed by. I want you to look at some of these names real quick and give you an idea of who they were from the Old Testament. And I want you to notice the differences in the names from the Old Testament name and the New Testament name. Now, if we look at verse number 7 there, it says, And Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abiah. Now, who is that referring to when it says Reboam? That's Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. So there's a little bit of a different spelling there, that H and E there. So it would be R, you know, E-H. R-E-H. It's Rehoboam in the Old Testament. That's his name. So this is actually uh, uh, pretty common where it will, it will omit that, that E and H. Because look at verse 8. It says, And Asa begat Josephat. Right? It says, and, and Asa begat Josephat. That it, the, also, it, that in the Old Testament, Josephat, that is Jehoshaphat. So notice that it put an O right there, and it omitted in the name the E and the H. So you can kind of tell who it's speaking about there. And also you can compare the genealogies. If you want to look this up, this is in 1 Chronicles chapter number 9. Um, another difference that takes place 
And this is really important. Look at verse number 9. Uh, it tells you there, you know, and Ozias begat Joatham. That's just Jotham. So there's no A in the Old Testament. And Joatham begat, it says, Achaz. Now that is Ahaz. That's Ahaz. If you compare this genealogy to 1 Chronicles chapter number 9, this was the king of the Old Testament. His name was Ahaz, not Achaz in the Old Testament. New, to New Testament, when it's translated, it's Achaz. Notice that it's a CH. Well, that's how you can fit. This can help you figure out who that's speaking about in verse 5. Where it says, And Solomon begat Boaz of Rechab. So what happened there with the C and the H? With Achaz. They just added that, right? That C, right? So what it, what it really is, or, yeah, yeah, they just added the C. So what it really is was Rahab from the Old Testament. It becomes a C-H instead of just an H. Okay? And then Ezekias, that's Hezekiah. This is real common. The, the ending right there, you notice it says Ezekias. So it ends with an A, an I-A-S, Ezekias. Well, that's Hezekiah. So like uh, Jeremiah from the Old Testament, sometimes you'll see when like a verse is quoted, it'll say, thus was fulfilled by the prophet, and it'll say Jeremiah's. Notice how they both end in the same way. I-A-H, Jeremiah. But in the New Testament, it's Jeremiah's. It's I-A-S. Same thing with Isaiah. It's Isaiah's. It's, it's uh, you know, spelled, all of it is spelled basically the same except it's an E instead of an I. But they, you know, virtually make the same sound. Like in, you know how the sounds change in Spanish as well with the E and the I. They reverse. They transpose. Right? So it's the same thing, you know, when it goes from Hebrew to, a very similar at least feature from he, uh, Hebrew to Greek. So it's Isaias. So the end is, is I-A-S, just like it was I-A-H. So you can figure out who these people are that it's speaking about when you kind of get these patterns of the changes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So, the same thing, look at the end of verse 10, very end of it. Uh, it says, and Amon begat Josias. That's Josiah, so that would just be an H. In the Old Testament, it's an S in the New Testament. You know, Jeconias, that's Jeconiah with an H, right? In verse 11, and Josias begat Jeconias. Uh, we'll keep reading down through now. It says, and his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel. And Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. There's another one. That's, Zerubbabel is spelled with an E in the Old Testament. O's are swapped out for E's. That's another change that takes place. And there's a couple of other ones. Uh, you, you can kind of compare them and figure them out yourself. And then we kind of get into some people that aren't really mentioned in any of the uh, 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 genealogies of the Old Testament. It says, And Zerubbabel begat Abiad, verse 13, And Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azer, and Azer begat Sadak, and Sadak begat Achim. And Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Nathan, and Nathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. And then it says this, who is called Christ. So that's who that's leading up to. We have the first 14 generations. That was from Abraham to David. He's the king of the Jews. Then you have the next 14 generations. That was from David to Salathia, which was the time when they were carried away into Babylon. And then after the point when they were carried away into Babylon to the birth of Jesus Christ was another 14 generations. So right here we have the birth of Jesus Christ being mentioned. We're told, it says in verse 16, in Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, that's talking about Mary, of course, was born Jesus, and then it says this, who is called Christ. Now I want you to go back with me to Psalm chapter number 2, verse number 2. I want to get the definition of Christ, because we're going to be seeing that word repeatedly through the book of Matthew, because that is what the fulfillment is. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the coming of the Christ. One moment ago when I said the King of the Jews... The king of the Jews is the Christ. That is who the king of the Jews is. And we'll get a definition and we'll, we'll get an idea of what the word Christ actually means. So look with me at Psalm, Psalm chapter 2. It's the book of Psalms. We're going to go to, whoops, Psalm chapter number 2. Psalm chapter number 2. It's a pretty famous psalm. You may have memorized this at some point. Let me get there myself. Psalm chapter number 2. Look with me at verse number 1. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now look at verse number 2. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and then it says this, and against 
his anointed saying. Now keep your hand there and I want you to turn to the New Testament to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 4. Now we, I'm going to show you the importance of comparing scripture and specifically if you see something that is, that is quoting the Old Testament it's very important to look that passage up from where it is quoted. Because oftentimes what God will do is he'll teach you something. Just like uh, you know you have the method of rep, uh, repetition. You know, God will oftentimes repeat things and you can kind of get, a, get a, a more vast idea of what he's talking about. Another thing that God will do is God will repeat things from Old Testament to New Testament. He will reiterate something or he'll re-quote something. And what he'll do is he'll, he'll exchange words out. He'll use words interchangeably and synonymously. So uh, that verse from Psalm chapter number 2 is actually quoted here in Acts chapter number 4. Look with me at verse number... 25, it says, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? So we're in Acts 4, look at verse number 26. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord. Now watch this. And against his Christ. Now notice that time. It says against the Lord and against his Christ. Christ. What did Psalm chapter number 2 tell you? It said that they were gathered together against the Lord and it said, and against His anointed. You know what we can learn from this is what the word Christ actually means. It means anointed. It means that He's selected. Or it means, like you'll often hear, that Jesus Christ is the chosen one. What does it mean to be anointed? It means to be chosen. So what it's saying is that He is the chosen one. What does the Christ mean? It means that He is the chosen one. The word Christ actually means Messiah. I want you also, let's go ahead and go to John the book of John, John chapter number 2. I believe it's John chapter number 2. <clears throat> Give me just a second. John chapter number 1, look at, uh, look at verse number 41. It's John 1. Verse number 41, it says this. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah. Now, no, that's Messiah. Remember what I was saying just a minute ago. When you Old Testament, it'll have H right there, right? Uh, A-I-H. Many things are spelled that way, like Hezekiah. It became Hezekiah or Ezekiah. Notice it says Messiah. That's Messiah. So it says, We have found the Messiah, or Messiah, which is being interpreted. Look at this. The Christ. So notice that we can learn a lot about just beginning on what does the word Christ mean. Well, an, the, what the word Christ means is it means anointed or it means chosen one. And the word Christ is the word that is used exclusively in the New Testament to speak about he who is the anointed one. Now, the word Christ, what it, uh, uh, what it is in the Old Testament is Messiah. So the, the word Christ in the New Testament is the Old Testament word Messiah. So when we're saying, hey, Jesus, Christ, or Jesus the Messiah, what we're saying is Jesus the Christ. The Christ is just a New Testament. It's a Greek origin word, originating word. And then also you have the Old Testament word, which is the Messiah. They were just saying Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Christ is the same thing. And what does that mean as far as what is the definition? It means anointed one. So that's what we're saying. Now, uh, I want you to turn one other place with me while we're looking at this. I want to go to the end of the book of Luke. Luke, and I'm going to show you that what the Messiah or what the Christ is, is he is the king of the Jews. What the, this is why this is very relevant right now. Because what he is going through is, it, what we see in Matthew chapter number 1 is we see the royal line. That's what you see in Matthew chapter number 1. That's why he, he begins right there with Abraham, which is the promise of where the Messiah or the Christ would come from. That is what the promise that was given to Abraham. The promise that was given to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, if you will, was the promise of the good news of the Christ to come, the gospel of the Messiah to come and that he would be born of him. So he begins in, in uh, uh, the genealogy with Abraham and he's going down because of him will come the Messiah of the Christ, uh, the, who is the Christ. Now the Messiah or the Christ is the king of the Jews. He is to be he who is going to rule the people, the ruler of the people. That's why when you follow that line, who does it ultimately get to? It gets to David. Who is what? It tells you David the king. And now what we're going down is we're going down the royal line of the Jews. You know what it's going to be? It's going to be the king of the Jews. That's what you're following. 
Who is what? And who are we ultimately going to get to at one point? It's going to stop at Jesus the Christ. Now I want to show you that the Christ was uh, uh, prophesied and is the uh, King of the Jews. That's who the Christ is. Look at uh, Luke chapter number 23. Look at verse number 1. It says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Watch this. Saying that he himself, watch this, is Christ a king. Now notice how that's worded there. It's saying he himself is Christ. Now who is Christ? A king. So what it's telling you is that who the Messiah is, one of the attributes or one thing that the Messiah or the Christ does, is he's a king. So what ultimately, that's why in Matthew chapter number 1, that's why that genealogy begins with Abraham because that's of whom the Messiah or the Christ is going to come from. And it works its way down to David. And then it highlights right there, David the king, to let you know that now we're following that royal line. And of the Jews, we're on that royal line now. And ultimately, who is going to come forth is he who is going to be the ruler. He is going to be the king of the Jews. This is the royal line in Matthew chapter number 1. Of Abraham, specifically. There were many other Israelites. There were many other Jews. But this is specifically the royal line of the kings of the Jews. And then ultimately, who you see being born at the end is the king of kings of the Jews, who is what? The Christ. That's who the Christ is. So what does the word Christ mean? It means anointed. And what's another word for Christ? Messiah. Old Testament word is Messiah. The word Christ is not found at all in the Old Testament. The word Messiah is found, and when you find it, he's called a prince. What's another word for a prince? A king. So you notice that? What does it mean to be a Christ, uh, the Christ, or what does it mean when they're saying the Christ is going to come? You know who they're waiting for? They're waiting for the king to come, the ruler to come. And we'll see that over and over again with the Israelites. They wanted a king. They wanted Jesus to be a king and to rule over them because that's who the Messiah ultimately is. That's why you know, uh, he is referred to as the Christ or the Messiah. He is the king, the king of kings. So we see there, it tells us about him. Also, I want to look at one other passage. I do have this. This one I have actually written down. Look with me at Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter number 27. I want, want you to see what's highlighted. Uh, uh, and this is a superscription that was hanging over top of Jesus. And this is meant to be an accusation. And you know, the Jews even, they even objected to it. And they tried to tell Pilate, like, hey, take it down. <clears throat> Don't let it say, you know, that, that he is the king of the Jews. Let it say that he said that he is. Look at, look at uh, verse number 37. And, and set up over his head his accusation written. Look at this. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So it's so ironic, even though the Jews, of course, as we know, rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and he died. Do you know what he died with written over his head? Do you know what they had to look at while he was bleeding and dying and he was taking his last breath? They looked at Jesus, whom they had rejected, with a big sign over his head and a superscription that said, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And I don't think that it's a coincidence. I think that it's providential that they were like, Hey, change it. And Pilate's like, No. He's not going to die with it saying he said that he's the king of the Jews. God wasn't going to allow that. He's going to die with it saying, this is Jesus. You know who he is? The king of the Jews. Because he was the Christ. And when we, we, we look at Matthew chapter number 1, what do we see? The king of the Jews. And notice it ends in Matthew 27 with what? The sign over his head that says, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. That is the theme of Matthew chapter number 1. 